Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. It's getting bitter cold out there, and I'd break out the mittens if I could, but, well. But speaking of mittens that I sadly don't have, bundle up tight and fear more than the cold. Old Mr. Mitten Hand. I've lived in this little town most of my entire life. Granted, there was that period of time after high school and before becoming a full-fledged adult, but when my parents died, I inherited their house. So, that bit about me living here most of my life is paramount. I didn't really mind coming back, I actually welcomed the idea with open arms, but I expected to have gotten past certain things by now. I thought it was over, long over, but nothing could have been further from the truth. The swings in the backyard, the creaky front steps, all of it played out as some bad omens of times gone by, but to my daughter of six, the place offered nothing but great new memories to sculpt. The backyard was a picture taken right from that slice of typical idealized Americana. Swings attached to a clubhouse and a slide, a sandbox in the corner. Of course, none of this stuff was here when I was a kid. The swings I used were tied to tree branches in the back of the yard, on the edge of the tree line, near the path that led deeper into the forest connecting to many backyards in the neighborhood. Those swings had long since rotted away, though, but that path remained traversable and beaten down through the years. Mom and Dad put all this child-friendly, much more extravagant than I ever had it, apparatus in the backyard in their later years in anticipation of visits from grandchildren. I think they knew that if they had something at their house the kids wanted, that they would beg to go see Grandma and Grandpa. As parents usually are, mine were right. Haley loved going to see my folks. So, a few months ago, my parents passed, and as a result, they left me the house. I could have sold it if I wanted to, but my wife insisted we move in. We had been in the market for a bigger home anyway, and one that was already paid for seemed like a no-brainer. Complacency and the passage of time secured any residual unrest regarding the place, and I knew Haley would love it. She adapted quite well to Mom and Dad's death, only shedding tears at the funeral itself. Sure, there were many questions about death coming from her, but that's natural at that age, and soon we all began to think of this place as our own. We even went out and got Haley a pet cat. She called her Boots due to her enlarged white feet. Needless to say, Haley was loving her new surroundings in no time flat. We told Haley to stay in the backyard when she went outside to play, but as with most children and their adventurous appetites, she would occasionally disappear down that path, never going too far, but always being called back. Yesterday, though, things played out a little differently, and Haley said something to me that sent shivers down my spine. The day was peaceful, sunny, and bright. A normal day in a seemingly normal neighborhood. I went inside for only a few minutes, when I went inside, she was playing on the swings, but when I returned, she had gone. Haley? I called out, but got no answer. Haley! I yelled a little more assertively. Nothing. No rustle of approaching footsteps or responding voice calling out. I walked my way over to the mouth of the path. Haley, you get back in this yard right this instant. 
I yelled in her presumed direction, and after getting no reply still, I began walking down the path into the increasingly growing darkness of shadow supplied by the canopy above. Haley, where are you? I called, and even though I got no response, I saw something when I rounded the small forested bend. An object in a little blue dress, adorned with yellow flowers, just staring off into the forest beyond. Haley, there you are. Didn't you hear me calling for you? I said as I jogged closer to her. My little one turned, acknowledging that she noticed my approach and spoke, You scared him away. Scared who away? The man with the mitten hands. Time seemed to stop and reality shrunk, as if I was seeing everything through a TV glass. What she said, what she deliberated after, the more she uttered her sentences, the more dread and grimness of impending doom welled up inside me, and I couldn't help but recall the reasons I tried to tell myself not to come back here. I was 16. Back then, my friends and I would hang out on those trails. Being teens, we'd drink pilfered beer and smoke illegal substances. But it was always in good fun. We never meant to harm anyone. Sometimes we'd stay out late, or even camp, and although I had heard of him and seen him before, this is how I actually became acquainted with old Mr. Mittenhand, or at least, that's what us kids in the neighborhood called him. Old Mr. Mittenhand got his name from his deformed right hand, having two extra appendages that served as tiny additional fingers. It was actually kind of gross to watch him handle things, because you could see those two little nubs bend and grasp whatever it was in his clutches. Accenting the disturbing visual nature of this particular deformity. That wasn't all, though. Mr. Mittenhand looked kind of off. He was very tall, likely about six foot four. He had two ears that stuck out far from the sides of his head like an elephant, and his face was kind of funny. No sunken eyes or cleft palate or anything like that. More like it wasn't quite symmetrical. Mostly, he never said much, just collected stray beer cans in the woods, mostly left by us, I imagined, and returned them for whatever necessities he needed to prolong his stay in the woods. I don't know how it got there. It was probably his now that I think about it, but there was this old mattress in the woods, the foam and fabric long since rotted away leaving only the springs and its skeletal frame. I had tossed down a few extra shirts that I had with me and crashed there for the night. I was startled in the morning by someone reaching underneath me, eyes shooting open. I discovered old Mr. Mittenhand reaching beneath me, only to pull out an empty can to stuff into his bag. Uh, good morning, I said to him not knowing much else what to say. Hi, he said back. Short, sweet, and nothing else. So, I did what any smoking teen would do. I lit up my morning cigarette. Mr. Mittenhand eyed the glowing cherry as I pulled in a drag. Um, think I could get one of those? He asked. Sure, sure, I said. He seemed nice and harmless enough, so I saw no harm in it. I didn't spend much time there after that, getting up and walking to Johnny's house to knock on his door. Never once did it go through my mind that maybe he should fear us. Weeks had gone by and all my friends had heard of my little encounter with old Mr. Mittenhand. Dude, did he grope you with his little fingers? Eric teased me, 
wingling his fingers behind his one hand to create a piss-poor appearance of two extra digits. Shut up, dude, I replied. Shh, you know, he could probably hear you guys. He's right over there, Johnny pointed out. What the hell do you mean? I asked. On my way here, I saw him a little ways back that way, in the woods just sitting by a smoking fire or something. Johnny informed us. You guys want to go have some fun? Eric asked us deviously. What do you mean? I inquired. But Eric just swiped the cigarette from my pack and said, You'll see. Hey, Johnny, show me where. Johnny agreed and we each followed him down the trail and off into the woods to the side of it. Before long, the three of us could see him. The giant mass of his body just sitting there on the ground. A small fire smoking in a hole and an open blank tin can on the ground beside him. All right, guys, watch this, Eric said. Neither Johnny nor I knew what was going to happen, but it was I who gave Eric the match when he asked for it. Before turning around and facing old Mr. Mittenhand, Eric broke the head of the match off its stick and shoved it deep into the tobacco of the front of the cigarette that he had taken from my pack. Dude, no way, Johnny laughed. Hell yeah, guys, this is going to be funny. I didn't really see the harm, so I gave a slight chuckle myself. Eric turned and approached the man. Hey there, old Mr. Mittenhand, you want to smoke? He called out. Startled and obviously not noticing our approach, the man turned his head, confused, as if not hearing Eric correctly. Huh? He mumbled gruffly. I said, would you like a cigarette? Here, man. You're chill. I saw you sitting here and just wanted to offer you a little toke and whatnot. Old Mr. Mittenhand didn't say a word, but when Eric extended the cigarette out for him to take, the man took it greedily. Thanks, he said with an awkward smile. You need a light? Eric asked, pulling out a lighter. The man leaned out his head with the cigarette held firmly between his lips and awaited the flame to touch the end. He inhaled deep, and once lit, Eric said his goodbyes and walked away. Once far enough away, the three of us ducked behind a tree and awaited the pun to take shape. But something turned our light-hearted thoughts into those of terror and foreboding disaster. We all watched old Mr. Mittenhand lift the small tin can from the ground and, with a jerking motion, splashed some of the brownish liquid onto the fire, resulting in a massive upshoot in flames, and as he drew it back, the contents sloshed all over his clothes, down the front of his dirty, worn-out shirt, and onto his muddy blue-jean pant legs that were now almost gray with filth, now dampened with the same gasoline he had thrown on his fire, a realization we took in upon witnessing the pyrotechnics resulting from a single splash. My eyes widened as old Mr. Mittenhand patted and wiped his clothing with his bare hands. I was right about to shout out to him. The words were right there on the very edge of my lips. But the cigarette in his mouth flared the cherry reaching the head of the match and causing a gout of combustion to engulf the end of the small white stick. Panicked by the sudden flare-up, we watched as the flaming cigarette fell from his surprised face and bounced off his shirt. Old Mr. Mittenhand went up in flames in an instant, without even a chance to react. We... I... I listened to him howl in agony, watched him dance around in pain. I couldn't speak. I couldn't formulate any words. We watched him run off into the woods, wailing in terrible anguish until the sounds of his screams had become either too distant to hear or he had just stopped making them. We were just kids. The three of us debated what we should do, if we should follow him, but... We were just fucking kids. We left. We never said a word. I thought it was over. I 
after all these years. I thought it was over. You see, the cat we bought for my daughter, the one with the overly big white feet, is mitten toed. And when she asked about the seven toes on his front paws, that's exactly how we explained it to her. So her telling me that she's been talking to a man with a mitten hand scares the hell out of me. Because it's not beyond her to make that correlation. But what terrifies me even more, more than the realization that he's still out here, and may possibly remember who I am and what we did. Is her telling me that he's right behind me and I can feel the rhythmic sensation of warm air breathing down my neck. Well, if that doesn't send shivers up your spine, I don't know what will. Well, maybe next week's story would do it. So, before you go, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can morbidly amuse you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>